It's The Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert. Global inequality continues to intensify unabatedly. The richest 1% of people uh, now have an estimated worth that is greater than half of all humans on Earth. But who are they, and what role do they play in the fate of the planet? This is something that a recently published book titled Giants, the Global Power Elite aim aims to explore. The book's author is Peter Phillips, who joins us now from Sonoma County, California. Peter is professor of political sociology at Sonoma State University and the former director of Project Censored. Thanks for joining us today, Peter. Greg, thanks for having me on. So in the introduction of your book, you talk about the emergence of a transnational capitalist class. Uh, what is this, and what do you mean by that, and how is this different from the, uh, the global elite that, or the elites in general that used to exist before the emergence of this class? Well, uh, C. Wright Mills did his book, The Flower Elite, back in 1956, and that was about elites in the U.S., military, um, political, and corporate. Um, in that 60-some year period now, uh, we've seen a globalization of power and, and wealth in the world, so that capital is concentrated in very, very few hands, uh, the hands of what I call the giants. These are the transnational investment companies, 17 of them have over a trillion dollars in assets. Collectively, the 17 controlled $41 trillion in uh, 2017. They represent uh, and are the investment, uh, literally the investment banks and investment advisors for the thousands to 2,000 plus billionaires and the 36 uh, <clears throat> million millionaires in the world who put their money into investment capital uh, where they want to get a return, annual return. Uh, and that's being being concentrated. Um, the wealth is concentrated even even greater now. It's like eight people have control over half the wealth in the world. Um, but what boils down to is, is 80 percent of the people in the world live by less than ten dollars a day. Half of the people in the world live on less than three dollars a day, and about a quarter live on less than two. So there's massive inequality. Thirty thousand people a day die from starvation and malnutrition. So there's this ongoing massacre of, of people uh, when there's more than enough food in the world, a lot of a third of it's thrown away because uh, it's just not profitable to sell it. So this whole system is pretty much non-humanitarian based upon gaining profit and capital concentration. Um, and it's managed to, of those 17 giant investment firms, there's only 199 people that um, manage those firms. So they're deciding how wealth will be invested fifty trillion dollars worth now um, and making those kinds of decisions and well, their biggest problem is they've got more capital than they've got safe places to put it in so um, <clears throat> governments try to accommodate them um, by for you know pressuring third world countries and other nation states to allow capital penetration and development um, and guarantee returns and debt collection uh, but still there's, there's much more profit than they have so they're buying up public resources around the world, water rights, freeway systems, whatever they can buy up to get a return. So they're privatizing the world. And even still, there's too much capital. So uh, what we're seeing now, particularly in the last 20 years, um, is permanent war. So war is very profitable for capital. They get a return on it. Um, the biggest uh, investment companies are all invested in Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and, and, and those that... Uh, make profits from war. Um, so permanent war, buying up of public resources, and speculative investments, like the subprime mortgage um, system that almost collapsed us in 2008. Uh, they're still doing those kinds of speculations. So very concentrated, very small number of people impacts us all. So give us an overview of what this global power elite is like in terms of what they do. I mean, you identify various sectors such as financial power, which you already mentioned, but then there's also managerial uh, power, policy making power, military, which you mentioned, and uh, media and public relations. W what are each one of these functions and uh, who are their main players? Well, <clears throat> we identify 389 people in the book by name and give bios on their background, where they went to school, and their net worth, and uh, the stocks they own, the corporate corporate boards they're on, and the policy groups. So we're, this is privatized, I mean, this is private capital. So this is non-governmental uh, policy making. So these 199 elites in capital, they're the ones managing $50 trillion worth, worth of wealth worldwide. 
But governments, the military, intelligence agencies, uh, policy groups, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, work on their behalf so that they are trying to protect capital, allow it to continue to grow and expand, and, uh, and continue to see privatization and the buying up of the world's resources held by a very small number of people. This is, this is ongoing. Now, they facilitate this by creating policy groups that are non-governmental, like the Council of 30. This is what I call the Executive Committee uh, of, of Global Capitalism. They, they're based in Washington, D.C., million-dollar budget, paid staff, and there are 30 central bankers, economists, some of the top uh, thinkers in the world, uh, there's 32 people, 31 men, one woman, um, and they put out policy reports that are seen as instructions by the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and, and governments from that perspective. Uh, the other big policy groups that are private are the Trilateral Commission, which is some 400 uh, people, non-governmental people. Uh, if you're in government, you can't be in the Trilateral Commission. From, from 40 countries all over the world, um, Asia, Europe, and and um, and the U.S. and and all and other countries, where they put out policy reports, uh, they were the ones that made the recommendations uh, to to do more containment with Russia, and were promoting a regime change there to try to get rid of Putin. Uh, the third one is the Atlantic Council, which is made up of nations of NATO, and these are people that meet in in Washington. There's around 35 on their executive committee. They're all high-level security people and or investment advisors, um, and they are in the process of protecting global capital. They're the ones that made the recommendations to Facebook as to who to drop last year, uh, who did they think was, was um, not supporting uh, capitalism and global capital. That's essentially the criteria for people that get dropped. They, they'll call it and say they're, they're not truthful or they're lying or something like that, but they're the ones making policy recommendations for regime changes in Venezuela or Iran, Russia, and, and pressuring China in a variety of factors as well. So do all of these uh, sectors have the same interests or, and ideology, or do their interests and ideologies diverge? Or another way of asking this, do they ha share a common kind of class interest, and uh, do they see themselves as a class, so to speak, that acts more or less in unison, or are there differences? Well, class is defined, you know, as culture, as 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 families intermarrying, as common values, similar ed education systems. So yes, if you look at the bio biographies of these people, they're going to private elite schools. Um, they're they're wealthy. Uh, they're in policy groups. They live in major cities around the world, um, and they interact at Davos every year um, in Switzerland or. Uh, other policy groups in a, in various capacities. Um, we've really been, really been talking about a transnational capitalist class in, in only for about 20 years. So there's more research that needs to be done in terms of the class-like nature of who these folks are. But it's quite clear that their primary motivation, their main involvement is capital. Capital investment, uh, free flow of capital anywhere in the world, no resistance from governments. So they're looking for governments, and they can work with dictatorships or democracies, either one, as long as the elites in those countries are facilitating, allow capital penetration, allowing returns on investment, and are, are police-wise and military-wise able to restrict their populations from resistance. So nation states um, are all tied into global capital. The elites of nation states, they get wealthy, in many places, the people are are quite poor, and um, <clears throat> but they're they're contained. So nation states are literally um, population containment zones for global capital use. So finally, I mean, one of the things one could say is perhaps that the uh, you know certainly that we are here at the Real News. We're always reporting about uh, the various crises that we're facing, and one of the big ones, of course, is the climate crisis, uh, and. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, or the issue is that perhaps this this global power elite is uh, contributing towards the uh, towards this crisis clearly in in various ways, uh, and so uh, it behooves of those who are not part of this 
to do something about this in tremendous inequality, not only in terms of the inequality, but also the, the other crisis that we might be heading towards. Um, but um, what can and should be done to uh, basically reverse some of these trends and assert or some semblance of democracy on a national or global scale? Well, I think it's important to recognize that these 17 giants and, and then other near giants are, are the center of global capital. They are making decisions of where capital is invested. Um, and so whether it's military or, or <clears throat> oil companies and uh, police states, um, what, whatever can return a profit, they're, they're engaged in it. Now, this is, of course, destroying the world, not only militarily, but in terms of in the environment. And we're on a very short timetable now to reverse CO2 emissions in the world, uh, or we will see a complete, uh, complete change on how humans survive on this planet, or even maybe, maybe possible extinction. So there's, that's, it, it's a crisis. And William Robinson, who does the introduction uh, to giants, uh, wrote a book called you know, The, the um, Crisis of Humanity, and he talks about the, the massive inequality and, of course, the environmental destruction that we're all facing. So we're appealing to these elites, and that's why we name them, and we say this is who they are, and we have a letter at the back signed by 90 professors and, and associates and friends of mine who are saying to these power elites, look, you guys have to fix this. If you don't fix it, the world's going to face financial collapse and economic destruction. So if you think your grandchildren are going to have grandchildren, you, re you really re need to rethink what you're doing and engage in policies that instead of trying to have a trickle down, which doesn't happen, but there's a river of resources that goes to every child, every family in the world so that people can survive and live and, and build an economy from the bottom up. Um, we're, t we're telling them this in the, in the expectation, not in the expectation that they're going to see the light and do something, some might, but in the expectation that we will be also politically forcing them through social movements and political actions that they have to make changes um, or we're going to be faced with uh, economic collapse and environmental and uh, environmental destruction worldwide in which millions if not billions of people will die well there's so much more to discuss about this uh, on this issue and perhaps we can get back to you sometime uh, but we're going to have to leave it there for now i was speaking to peter phillips author of the book giants the global power elite thanks for having joined us peter thank you very much greg i like, I like doing it and thank you for joining the Real News Network. If you like Real News Network stories such as this one, please keep in mind that we're nearing the end of our winter fundraiser and need your help to reach our goal of raising $400,000. Every dollar that you donate will be matched. And unlike practically all other news outlets, we do not accept support from governments or corporations. Please do what you can today.